So welcome back to the True Man Podcast. Well, I always enjoy talking about masculinity and really how good men define it versus how it's sometimes portrayed out there in, uh, can we call it the Hollywood world? Let's call it the Hollywood world. They do a good job of, of mystifying this whole thing. So I know today's conversation is going to be a lot of fun. On today's show, meet Johnny L. Sasser. He is a men's development and leadership coach, and he's the creator of the Wild Man Experience, a program designed to help men grow and reconnect in a relaxing setting. He is also the host and founder of the Art of Masculinity podcast. So you got to check that out. Johnny, it is awesome having you here today. Thanks for being on the True Man podcast. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me on here. This is really awesome. Um, we had a great conversation on my show. We've talked a couple of times now and it's been a lot of fun. So uh, I'm excited to jump in here and serve your community, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Johnny, your mission, and I love it, is to help men find solace in themselves by redeveloping their masculinity to be consistent with who they truly are and what society ex expects them to be. But like most of us, right, you had to make a little pivot in your life to maybe get there and rediscover what that looked like for you. So tell us what you went through to get to the point where you are today. What did you discover? Yeah, it was very interesting. My background is is really in that alpha environment. I was special operations and then I was protecting the US ambassador to Iraq for years. And in that, I found myself like programmed in a lot of different ways. And I didn't understand the fundamentals of masculinity at the time. And when I left working overseas in 2013, July of 2013 was my last tour um, in Iraq. When I left there, I came back to the U.S. and had a full-time job with the government. And it, it took about six months. And all of a sudden, I'll never forget, because I was like, wow, I've been back six months. And I looked at my computer and I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like, who <laughs> am I right now? Like, I was like, I was a cog in a wheel that had essentially no purpose um, and it had just this monotony of crap surrounding it. And I was like, this is not feel good. This does not feel good to me. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know who I am right now. Cause I was no longer the special operations guy who was fighting for our flag. You know, I was no longer protecting a U.S. ambassador who was influencing, you know, war torn areas of the, the world to to have democracy and seek peace and things like that. And so there was always a bigger mission for me since I was about 18 years old to 28. And then at 28, I was like, whoa, where's my mission? And I didn't know how to create that. So just like many people who leave the military or leave police force or leave fire departments or paramedics, mm -hmm. first responders, any of these alpha jobs, yeah. just like many of these people, I didn't know how to create my own life. I didn't know how to create who I was, my own goals, my own mission. It was always written for me. And so I struggled with that. I struggled in my own mentality of like who I was showing up as in the world because I was still showing up as this alpha ranger, but that doesn't fly in society. You just <laughs> yeah, end up pushing right. people away. Yeah. Like you push people away. They don't like you. You're judging everybody. It's just this like, really, it's this, it's this conflicting mindset that doesn't allow people in. Um, guards you way too much. You're, you're looking at society in a very negative way. And it leads to a lot of just pain and suffering and negative thoughts. And so it serves a purpose. And we can go down that road too, at some point, it serves a purpose for sure. And I love the life that I lived before all of this. But what I realized was when I came back, it was not helping me, it wasn't serving me in any positive yeah. way. And that resulted in a divorce that resulted in way too much drinking that resulted in a purposeless, you know, few years where I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I was just floating and floundering um, and just really living for the weekend. And to me, life is more than that. Life is more than living for the weekend. And so I ended up going into bodybuilding 
which gave me a purpose. I'd always, be, I've been working out since I was 16 years old. I love it. It's a part of who I am. It's not a have to do for me. It's a get to do. And so I was like, well, let me try bodybuilding. Like I already do this. I don't have a bad relationship with food. Let me set a goal for myself. And that was really my catalyst kind of out of that toxic mindset that I had was, okay, I have something bigger than me. There's a show, there's a competition. There's something that's four months away that I get to train for every day. And it's something bigger than what I am now and gives me purpose, right? Gives me purpose of past the weekend. And so that really was a catalyst for me to get out. And then um, as I was in that, I, I was part of a bodybuilding team and I had a coach and one of the women in there who was also a friend of mine from the gym, she and I started to connect and become close friends. And she was like, Hey, have you ever listened to Lewis Howes or have you ever listened to Josh Trent or have you ever listened to some of these podcasts that were really helpful? And Mike, Mike, I was like, <laughs> what's really? a podcast? You're tell me <laughs> yeah, what's a, what's a podcast. And then you're yeah. going to tell me to go listen to another man about how to be a good man. What does this guy know? I've been kicking in doors overseas since I was 18 years old. Like what are these guys going to tell me? <laughs> right. So there's a huge egoic chip on my shoulder. Um, and then she then tossed me a book and it was excuses be gone by Dr. Wayne Dyer. I'm sure you, you know, this one, um, Wayne Dyer's got some great books. Yeah. I, Phenomenal. I love his stuff. Yeah. I'd love his stuff. All yeah. of his stuff. And, and go ahead. No, I would just say, yeah, I just enjoy his material. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And like it, um, he, the way he writes, he was highly educated, but wrote like he was just slapping you right in the face, not in a mean way, but like a, oh crap. Like I am, I need to realize I'm doing this to myself kind of way. And he calls you out. And so she threw that to me and I was like, whatever. It took me about a couple of months. And I was like, I picked it up and I started reading it. And I was probably about halfway through the book. And I was like, oh, wow. I have been making up so many excuses on why I judge people, why I still act as the ranger, although I'm no longer in that environment, why I hide myself from my own insecurities, like why I do a lot of these things. It was all me creating excuses around not wanting to actually find out who I was and who I could be. And so after I read that, I was like, holy crap. All right, I got you. And then I started listening to a podcast here or there. Um, and started to really be like, wow, there's, there is a shift in mindset that I can create. And a lot of what's happening in my life, a lot of the, oh, life sucks, or a lot of the, oh, these things happen to me, not for me. A lot of that was because of my mindset and I could shift that perspective. And so when I started to realize that my friend, who is now my wife, Taylor was, she, she was like, she was like, Hey, you men deserve to have your voice and men will respect your background enough to give you the time of day to say, let me at least listen to a little bit of what he's saying. And all the guys that were thinking like me that wouldn't listen to a podcast or wouldn't pick up a self-development book, they'll at least give me the time of day to say, Hey man, I respect what this guy's done enough to be like, let me listen to him. And if I can give them any tool that may just shift them a little bit to having a better relationship with their family, a better relationship with their friends or with their spouses or better relationships just with themselves, yeah. like that to me is a huge win. So that's where the shift for me came in. That's where I started to take up the, the mantle and, and created a purpose for myself and started to take up the torch and say, all right, let me be a leader of men. Let me, I've done this in the military, but let me now do this with my voice and do this with my intellect. And I was all in on researching. I was all in on getting knowledge in tools and tips. And I still am. I still constantly try to educate myself to help men, to help them the best that I can so I can give them a leg up. So that's really where the shift came in. Wow. There's so much to talk about in, uh, and unpack in what you just said, but you know, it, it, it's interesting to me because you were in such an alpha male environment and, you know, I've never been in that kind of environment, but I think a lot of guys think they have been, whether they are or not, right? Like you all of a sudden become an alpha male when road rage pops up or something, something as simple as that, right? Like all of a sudden you take yourself into that environment and you said something that I think is really 
pretty key to this. And that is, yeah, we want, you and I both want the same thing. We want, you know, good, we want to help make men be better, better men, but you can't be a better man until you start to dive inside yourself and fix what's, Mm -hmm. you know, what's going on there. So talk about that a little bit. How can, how can we help create masculine men that will take a second to pause and look in the mirror and go, you know what? I'm carrying around some baggage. I got it. I got to fix this. I got to fix this before I move on. And I hate the term fix, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Change or adjust yeah. or adapt, yeah. whatever. Like there's, yeah. Um, it's a great question. And I always go back to the fundamentals. When I was in special operations, the reason why we were as good as we were was because we hounded the fundamentals. It was just beat into us. And us as men, we never actually learn the fundamentals. No matter what anybody tries to tell you, you actually never learn the fundamentals. Because if we go back from ages two to eight, we're in what's called theta brainwave. In the theta brainwave, it's what hypnosis uses for programmability, right? So we're programmed in this state and it's being implemented in us, not by choice, but by the fact that we're just a recipient of this information visually and verbally, right? So we're receiving this. And and in that time, a lot of our foundational programming of what a man is supposed to be is actually developed in those years. And so the first piece to say, hey, yeah, I need to go inside is to realize a lot of what you hold today (laughs) in masculinity wasn't written by you. It was written for you. Yeah. And so it's, That's the first thing is be like, okay, what's the fundamentals? Okay, my fundamentals, I need to go back to who were my biggest influences in two to eight years old. Now, when you dive into masculinity, the other piece of the fundamentals is that you have to understand there are social theories around this. And one of the biggest um, developers of this was in the 1970s. And her name was Raywin Connell. Funny enough, she's a transgender woman. And she actually was the one that kind of came up with the social basis around masculinity and hegemonic masculinity. And a lot of what we find out is that there are different, there's numerous different theories out there on what it is that develops us as men in those early stages. And it doesn't necessarily mean Mike my, my father, Mike is the one that developed my masculinity. It right. actually could be, Oh, I really look up to my uncle and my uncle developed my masculinity, or it could be, Oh, I watched a lot of movies and the TV screen created my version of masculinity, which actually is a lot of us, especially, yeah. Yeah. you know, as uh, most of us, like it's, it's, it's one of the biggest ones it's called the normative theory. And it's a whole, where we a whole generation of us that grew up when HBO started. Right. And we heard about uh, our, our the sexual education occurred on the playground as a result of seeing movies on HBO of all places. Right. <laughs> it's incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and not only that, but as, as TV shows and movies became more abundant. We're watching more and spending more time with these things. And they're shaping the way that we view masculinity. And this is also for women too. Like women had their masculinity on versions of what they desire shaped about that by this. But in the end, it's understanding that those fundamentals are there and that we have to concede to the fact that unless you've done the work where you've sat down and addressed this and gone internally, this is the first piece to going internal is recognizing that, that there is all of these things within you and you may not enjoy them. You may not believe them. And so it's like, okay, let's understand first that we have a lot that was written for us. And then second, let's go ahead and dive into, okay, what are some of these traits I believe masculinity is And then let's evaluate if I actually hold value for them or if I don't value them at all. And once you realize that, you can start to pull pieces out and say, wow, well, I don't really, like you said, you and I were talking before, you're like, oh, fitness isn't a thing for me. You're a golfer. Stretching's a thing for me, right? Like I I love being out playing golf. So fitness may not be a version of masculinity that you subscribe to. It doesn't make a man and it doesn't not make a man. It just isn't something that's part of your masculine blueprint. And that's perfectly fine. But that's the whole thing is to sit there and say, okay, what is it that I don't value? And what is it that I do value and start to construct your own masculine blueprint? What we're doing is we're deconstructing the social creation of masculinity and then really creating the personal 
uh, theme of masculinity for yeah. us. And that's where we start. That's my, that's my biggest spiel on how men can really start to dive into themselves because now you get the opportunity to say, what is it that really does align with me? What is it that feels good to me? What is it that I show up as every day and will leave me in every situation, not regretting what I say, not regretting how I act, not regretting who I am, because that's what we live with a lot as men is shame, guilt, and regret. And yeah. how do we take that out? Well, you become authentic. You become authentic with how you show up in every situation. That's how you start to get rid of that. Well, it's important. I remember uh, doing some John Eldridge stuff when we were playing the old video. And anybody that listens to John Eldridge, you know, he's a pretty outdoorsy guy, does a lot of fishing, hunting, that type of thing. Now that, that I love being outdoors, but I'm not an outdoors man. I don't go hunt and fish. And uh, in this one particular scene, they were playing a video and they were talking about using, you know, chainsaws and that type of thing. And we were having a discussion about it. And one of the guys said, well, I don't feel any less a man because I don't know how to use power equipment. And, I, and you know, but, but, the, but it was interesting because I don't use power equipment either. But that doesn't make me feel any less of a man. That's just not my thing. And I'm not any right. less masculine as a result of it. So um, it was just kind of an interesting discussion that, that we were having. But I think an important discussion because masculinity is many things. It doesn't include right being able to fire off a machine gun or uh, power equipment. That I mean, maybe that's part of the equation if you like to do that. But I mean doesn't make you less of a man if you don't know how to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's part of what I talk to guys about is that like, first off, let's take it. Let's take an analogy here. If I take a guy from, you know, uh, middle of, you know, woods, Alabama, and I pick him up and drop him in New York city, right. Is his <laughs> version of masculinity going to translate to New York city? Probably not probably not at all. Right. And vice versa. You pick a guy up from the city, throw him over in Nebraska, middle of Nebraska farmland. Is his version of masculinity going to transfer over? No, probably not. So masculinity is one of those things that when you actually dive into the real research, psycho psychologically and socially, when you dive into it, one of the things with masculinity is that it's actually incredibly fluid. Right. And even in its definition, masculinity's definition, it's incredibly arbitrary and subjective. Like there's no, there's no actual defining piece to it that says this is masculinity. It's like to present, I, I believe I'll paraphrase here, but it's something like to present um, male traits within society or something like that. And you're like, wait, what? Like what? <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what that means. That like, was that's the first thing that popped into my head when <laughs> you said it. I was like, what, what, what did you say? Yeah. Yeah. When you look at, I'm a big, I love etymology. So it's like, let's dive into the etymology. So if we can't even define this as a culture collectively, and there's no set of rules, even regionally for masculinity within the U S what do you think masculinity is? Well, it's right now it's programmed until you decide yeah. to dive into it and say, what is true to me? It's programmed. It it's dangerous, right? I mean, we have all these superhero movies and all these things and they're cool. I mean, you know, we all, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you want to be Luke Skywalker or whatever. I get it. I get it. But that's not real life, you know? And I think a lot of people have this yeah. whole idea that it, sadly it creates real life for a lot of people, but that, it, I mean, it's just fictional and it's incredibly hard to be, um, well, I call it a true man. Um, if you're, you know, if you're, um, if, if you've, if you've fallen in love with these fictional characters that aren't real, I mean, fall in love with them for what they are, but not what they, you know, they're not really what they are. If that makes any right. sense. Right. Yeah, it's well, that's part of that normative theory is they create these characters around like I love like Clint Eastwood movies. I love like <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, John Wayne, like yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger. But they create these scenarios where the version of man that they that the main character is in works for that scenario. And remember, it's a movie. 
But because it's considered that normative theory of masculinity, it actually highly influences how we try to act in the real world. And in that, it's like, okay, well, right. then all of a sudden you're, you're following a prescription of masculinity that doesn't necessarily translate to the real world. And then you're wondering why you're sad and depressed and angry all the time. It's because you're trying to fit, you know, a square peg into a round hole. It doesn't work that way. Right. Right. Okay. I love your enthusiasm about this. So, <laughs> so, so since we're going down this rabbit hole, we got it. We got to talk about toxic masculinity and why it's a lie. Why it's a lie. Yeah. I hate the term toxic masculinity. <laughs> uh, like back it. to, uh, back to, back to etymology. Like what is toxicity in its definition? Toxicity in its definition is unfit for consumption. When you put these together, what you're saying is masculinity is unfit for consumption. So whether the people that are, uh, you know, pushing this narrative of toxic masculinity understand that or not is, is really beyond me because it's very arrogant and yeah. ignorant to say that masculinity is toxic. And you're also promoting a, uh, a definition of masculinity to a young generation who doesn't necessarily have the ability to think consciously for themselves yet and really make an evaluation of what you're saying. And so it's, it's this programmability. Again, they're programming the younger generations. And what's happening is people are thinking, and I think in my personal opinion is why masculinity has gotten so effeminized. Like we have this huge swing to um, feminization of masculinity. And that's because of the fact is that mainstream media has created a war on masculinity saying that it's unfit for consumption. And so when you tell me it's like toxic masculinity, it's like, no, I think what most people are trying to say is that there are men who behave in a toxic way, sure. similar to traits that may be associated with masculinity, but just like women behave toxically in ways of traits that are associated with femininity, it's the same thing. Femininity and masculinity are not toxic within, within and of themselves. What it is, is people behaving poorly of their own accord using traits that are associated. So I like to try to say that the, you know, cup is half full and give <laughs> these people the benefit of the doubt, but you know, it's like, it's sometimes it makes it hard when you got, you know, some of these crazy people that I won't go into certain names talking about that stuff. Listen, I, um, I had somebody try, this is an interesting, uh, cause I I'm with you. I, I, I'm like, I just blows me away. I mean, God created men differently than women and women differently than men, you know, for, for a wide range of reasons. But I, um, had a gentleman reach out to me on social media and, you know, the initial discussion was, was decent. And the next thing I know he's firing, uh, you're promoting toxic masculinity on your show. And I'm like, my, my podcast. Well, yeah. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm like, have you ever listened to my podcast? Yeah, but clearly not. Right. Because I mean, I'm right. same ideals that you're talking about. And, uh, I said, if you ever listened to my podcast, you would know that there's nothing toxic about it. And he said, well, the name of your podcast is true man, not true trans. You haven't included that in it. So it's not incorporating <laughs> I, you know, and I thought to myself, well, if you're going to go down this rabbit hole, uh, you know, I, I'm open to having this discussion with you, but I, my hunch is you're not going to want to have this discussion. So we're just going to cut this off. And I just thought to myself, why, why do people, why do people do this? I mean, you know, telling me that my podcast is, is, is toxic and it, it, it alarmed me a little bit. And then I thought, well, there's just, you're not, there's a whole, there's a percentage of people that are just going to do what they do. And there, there's nothing that you or I can do to change them. No matter how we try to appropriately <laughs> define it, you know, yeah. what, what we're doing. But I just thought that was an incredible yeah, story. I mean yeah, it, it, it really is. But it's also just like, it, it's an identification of this perverted nature of how society has conformed to this PC culture, where it's the PC stuff is all a social programming from the media on a 
just a ton of bullshit to really create conflict within society because a society that's fractured within one another is an easily controlled society. We can see that through, in, in my opinion, the pandemic and through everything that's been going on the last couple of years. Like a lot of this, the fact that they have done a great job fa fracturing. Um, this is why every four years, all of a sudden, uh, they create this racial divide, right? Yeah. Um, I grew up in California. I truly have never seen a lot of this. And I'm not saying there isn't racism, but there's racism on every level against yeah. every race in different pockets of the United States. Certainly. The way that they try to pervert it um, and they select, yeah, they select a narrative every four years. It's the same thing as the PC culture. If we can continue to stay fractured, they can continue to push control over the masses, right? And so that's what I hate about it because you're right. There's no reason for it. You've never slandered somebody of a different gender. You're not slandering people for life's choices. You named a podcast True Man because you're trying to help guys find that true man within themselves. Yeah. And yet you're being attacked for that. You know, exactly. it's just insane. Yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, it hurt for a little while. And then I realized if I'm going to do what I'm going to do, that I can't be, I can't worry about that. You know, I just can't worry about yeah. people like that because what he was trying to define is not anything even remotely close to how, uh, you know, I'm defining it or how I'm working with people. And, you know, I recognize you're not going to please everybody, but you know, I guess I'm going to spin that out of this because when you're working with men and we're talking about these types of, of, of topics, it's, it's, I think it's important that we create, you know, emotionally uh, intelligent uh, as well as intellectual, right? That's a, a good part of masculinity, I think, asking a lot of deep questions. But how do we create emotionally intelligent men? that understand these yeah. ideals? That's a great question um, because inherently men, just from the studies that I've read and obviously what we see with men typically, we, we don't identify intrinsically with emotions. Um, and so <laughs> part of this is, you know, part just of rub it, it out. <laughs> at, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Rub it out, pour some water on it, take yeah. your knee face out. You know, that's like, yep. Yep. You know, but I'm missing a leg, Sergeant. Um, yeah, walk it so off. It's just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's it's definitely like one of those things where when we talk about emotional intelligence, first off, I think the biggest the biggest thing is men have to start expanding their vocabulary <sighs> on emotional intelligence because, um, you know, I had a great conversation with a friend of mine who is a detective out of, was out of Houston. I think he's in Dallas now, and he's done a lot of work in the emotional intelligence space. And they did a research study on this where they actually gave men and women, um, he didn't do this. He found a research study. I apologize. He found a research study where they gave men and women the ability to write out how many emotions they could just list, just, just list. Mm -hmm. It's a vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And come to find out, actually, women didn't score much higher than men. They scored a little higher. But I think on average, men had about like five. And then women were somewhere around like eight to eight to 11 or something like that. And there's actually over, if I remember this correctly, and I could be getting this wrong, but I want to say there's something over 180 or 200 uh, emotions that we can actually classify. And I was like, holy crap, what? Wow. I didn't even know this. Yeah. And so when we talk about emotional intelligence and we look at the vast amount of emotions that we can have, well, how can we actually even explain it if we don't even know that it exists or we don't know how to say it? So I think the first thing is for men to really dive into what is my voc uh, vocabulary around emotions, right? And then if you're like, wow, I only really know like five emotions. Well, let me go start looking up other emotions. Let me start looking up a list of them and be like, oh yeah, I associate that. Now I can start expanding my intellect, right? I can start expanding that portion of my brain to say, now, whenever my wife does something that makes me a certain way, instead of me just going to the default of angry or <laughs> something that's, you know, something yeah. that's very mainstream, right? Instead yeah. of going through maybe one of the five, 
I go through number 10 or 12 or 15. And it actually really explains myself better to her. So then we can come together as a couple and then talk about that. But until we start to expand our intellect around the vocabulary of emotions, it's really hard for us to really even expand on emotional intelligence. The other thing I have for emotional intelligence for men is when you start feeling something, check in with yourself before you speak, like check in. Why am I feeling this? Right. What, what's causing me to feel this? Okay. Mike said that I feel offended that Mike said that what's making me offended. Okay. I'm offended because I was picked on when I was younger. Now I'm feeling like I was embarrassed. Oh crap. I'm resulting to offense because I'm actually embarrassed that I'm feeling this way because of something that happened when I was younger. The reason why I say this is because we dive that deep. Now, all of a sudden, when I'm talking to Mike and I say something and see him get a little defensive or he gets a little offended, I can actually be like, oh, he's probably feeling this way because that's how I felt when something was similar said to me. Right. Oh, let me maybe clar- clarify this or let me ask him a question or let me soften this a little bit. So when we start to find the reasons inside of us, when we start to find those emotions inside of us, we can start seeing them in other people. I'm offended. You called me out on that. <laughs> no, that, that is so brilliant. Actually, you know, I, there were, there's so many things to touch on in that. So actually, since you brought in checking in with yourself, which I think is, is awesome. Cause as guys, I find that we're, we're not very good at this. I've had to do some work around this, that, that, you know, we're talking about that one or two second hit the pause button before you hit the anger button. What's a good tip that you, maybe you use it for yourself or something that you've, you've used in coaching men that can help them hit that pause button and check in before they, you know, hit the fuse. Yeah. um, So mine is, I'm sure people have heard this in different ways growing up, but now that, you know, breath work is a lot more mainstream and we're starting to see huge physiological and mental uh, benefits to breath work. Honestly, what I do now is literally it's a circular breath. It's in through the nose, out through the mouth, in through the nose, out through the mouth. And it's in through the nose at the bottom of the exhale. So you're never stopping, like you're never pausing. It's in through the nose. So you're constantly having that circular breath. So what happens when I feel challenged by a statement, when I feel challenged by something, I actually give myself permission to think about the statement and think about the response that I'm going to have to it by saying, huh? And I go, yeah. And honestly, it sounds really just basic, but I will tell you right now, it has changed my relationship with my wife. It's changed my relationship on conversations like this in podcasts. It's changed my relationship with my friends because instead of spouting off with either an emotion or an opinion, right? I actually evaluate what they said first, give it merit. And then maybe my opinion or statement changes like, oh no, I really do see what you're saying, Mike. Okay. Let me ask a question now. Instead of me saying an opinion, let me ask a question now. So that's the other piece to that is it it allows you to really have a better response because especially when what we do when we breathe through the nose and out through the mouth, we actually go into the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we go into that parasympathetic, we're not responding in fight, flight, or fawn. We're not responding in that in the, as in the sympathetic, whereas emotions and reactions without having that breath can put us in a sympathetic response, which becomes defensive, survival, run away. You can, sometimes it's you concede the things you don't believe. And then you leave and you're like, crap, man, I really didn't believe what Mike said. Why did I agree with that? <laughs> you know, this is not your average ranger, folks. He just used the term parasympathetic. Um, and I said it in one, <laughs> I said it in one take, which is amazing in and of itself. Listen, I love the breathing concept. This is something I've been doing, um, a lot of work on myself. I, I remember the first time I was introduced to it, a lady walked up in front of, uh, a, a group of us and said, all right, let's do some breathing exercises. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? Really? And it, you know, it took me a little, uh, while to to buy into it 
but man, oh man, it can make you huge. And I did some meditation yesterday and I had to do a podcast after the meditation, dude, I could not wake up. I mean, I was just smoothed out. And so, you know, these, and, and there was a lot of breathing involved in that. And, and mm-hmm. I just think that they're life changers for the average guy before you react and say something that you shouldn't, and we've all done it. Just give yourself that second. I, you know, I think there's brilliance in that. The other thing I wanted to comment on is you were talking about, you know, that, that the, the study that you were talking on, isn't it interesting that, you know, they say we use such a small percentage of our brain. And I was thinking about that as you were comparing, well, we can, we're only touching these really finite, small amount of uh, emotions that we're tapping into. Like it's interesting. I was thinking about that as you were telling that story that we, we sometimes put our position, put ourselves in a position to live in such a small story by doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, so, absolutely. Because yeah. so many guys will land on angry and just sit and spin in it, and um, it's not healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and sometimes angry is actually anxious, but because we're not taught that anxiety is okay for men to experience, it's okay for women, but not for men. We don't associate anxiety with an emotion that we're having towards a situation, um, which is then promoting either anger or promoting fear or promoting something different, right? The, a different response system. So that's the other thing. And just real quick, back to the breath. The cool thing about the breath work is if you do actually practice it, like you did for meditation, if you actually start to practice this weekly, when you get in the moment of a heated argument with your spouse or a friend or something, it actually only takes like one or two breaths. And then you're like, oh crap, that was so fast. Now I'm responding better, but it's, it takes that practice for us we get to that mastery of like, okay, now it's just a couple, it's just a couple of breaths in this and I can come up with a better response. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about creating new habits here. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, if something, if something hasn't worked for you in the past, I wouldn't, and I do this all the time. I just encourage you to look in the mirror and go, okay, I keep blaming everybody the same thing keeps happening, you know, take a look in the mirror and, and figure out, well, how, how I can create a new habit and, um, you know, a one or two second pause. I mean, that's one way you can do it. Yeah. And, and like I said, that one or two seconds can change the game for what the conversation outcome is. And not only that, like we talk about, I'm sure you've mentioned this before, but most people know this is that, you know, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is what it's insanity (laughs) definition. And so, yeah, right. So like, if, if you're looking at Mike and I and be like, man, you guys, you guys have been practicing. I can't do this. Like, you know, if you're tired of where you're sitting in life and you're tired of the outcomes, do something different. What's the worst case scenario. You get the same result you had before. That's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is something changes. Why not try it? Yeah. Listen, it's funny you would say it that way. The first thing that popped into my head is it probably was, you know, five or six years ago when I really started to be got got involved in men's small group at a much more intimate level. And I remember being around a lot of really oriented guys that have been doing it for a while. And I, I seriously remember thinking, wow, that is heavy stuff. I I, I don't know that I could ever get there. <laughs> And now I have guys coming up to me going, wow, that's heavy stuff. I don't yeah. know that I could ever get there. And, you know, it, it, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. And, yeah. and listen, I'm not, I'm not suggesting I've arrived. I have not at all. I'm, I, I'm, I have so much more to learn and, and do and experience. And um, it's one of the reasons why I love doing the podcast. I'm sure the same reason you do is, you know, we get to explore so many different things and talk with such a variety of different people. And it just, it feeds where I'm at. It absolutely feeds my curiosity. And if there's one thing 
that I would encourage guys is, you know, get curious about what's going on. Get curious about emotion. Get curious about your faith. Get curious about how you become a, you know, a true man. Get curious about masculinity and study it and figure it out. And I, I think the results speak for themselves. You can have a much better life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just, I mean, this is what, uh, you know, kind of what I believe you're alluding to, but what also you and I, I think mutually love about podcasts is when you're a host, you get to be curious about the other person. So you get to learn because you're an open book. You're there as a receiving because as a uh, receiver, because you're like, okay, I have to absorb what they're saying. And I have to ask really good questions to really help my community, right. To give them something. Yeah. And I think men can all benefit from turning into the receiver in their lives and stop trying to always speak an opinion, start asking more questions, get, get inquisitive about somebody's yeah. profession or their life or their experience, start to learn more because it's going to create a wealth of knowledge for yourself. And it's going to give you the ability to understand more things that are out in this world that maybe you would enjoy doing. So if you, just to your point, get curious about things, get curious about yourself, about your mindset, about other people and start to develop and harness that to being, you know, a true man and start to create that guy within you. Yeah. I listen, I, I, um, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I commonly find myself uh, once I started doing the podcast, I'm, I find myself in my life, my outside life, outside of the podcast, podcasting. If, and that's what I call it. I'll often say to somebody, well, let me ask you a podcast question. And uh, I, that's just kind of my, and it's an inside joke. Most people don't, don't get that. But the point is, is that I find myself being more curious around everybody I meet because I want to know about them in the same way that I do that. I mean, when you come on a podcast, you do a podcast. I mean, like you're expecting questions today. When I came on your podcast, I was expecting questions from you. And sometimes in life, we don't expect that. And, and yeah. I think, you know, I'm at a point now where I think, gosh, what a shame that is because we all have a story. We all have a wonderful story. Some of us have great comeback stories and pivots and turnarounds. Your story is incredible. Um, mm. You know, and I think it serves quite honestly, it's such a great example um, for uh, people co coming out of the military, because I've heard these stories over and over again. And, um, you know, about how the uh, difficult the adjustment is. Um. And, and so, you know, but with, without being curious, without having platforms like this podcast, those stories don't get out. And I, I just think, gosh, what a loss for a story to get, to get lost, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then the other thing to that too, is like, what a loss for a man to not see his story yes. as valuable because- yeah. It's, it's just like, we, we live this life and we devalue ourselves a ton. I think men do this more than, than women. In my opinion, we devalue ourselves. Um, and part of that is the, the kind of social construct of men are expendable, which is why we fight in wars and not really women don't. Um, it's, it's more or less that we are expendable for society. And this has been the trend through the beginning of civilization. And so we we devalue ourselves a ton and we devalue our stories, but then all of a sudden somebody hears our story and they're like, Holy crap, Mike, your story is amazing. Yeah. And you're like, well, I just, I just lived it. I, I didn't think it's that amazing, but all of a sudden they see something in you that they would love to have in themselves. And it inspires them to change. It inspires them to do something different. Yeah. And so for all men out there, to your point, whether it's a comeback story, whether it's just your story in general, yeah. start to put, a, to, to put value to it, write it out maybe even, and, and start to look at it and say, wow, I really did have I've had an epic, crazy, weird life up until this point. And there's a lot of things that maybe would have set people back that I persevered through. Um, so it's just, it's cool to really get that aspect. Yeah. It's funny. I actually got chills when you said that put value to your story, uh, you know, because it, and I know you've seen this too, just too many guys miss that. Ah, they just miss mm -hmm. it. 
And it, you know, it doesn't matter what your story is. There is value to your story and there's value that you can add to somebody else as a result of whatever, you know, you've gone through or, you know, and, and I think that that, I think that's so critically important for men to know that Um, and be around men where they can hear story and tell story. Um, I Mm -hmm. wholeheartedly encourage that. And I know you do in some of the, you know, with some of the groups that, that you work with. I mean, that's the whole idea is to create a community of guys where those stories can be talked about. Absolutely. And it's remembering to, remembering to be the student when I was doing, um, when I was younger and I was in the military, uh, or really probably more when I was doing a lot of traveling, when I was doing protection, probably my first couple of years, I was traveling the world a lot when I had my off time. And, um, I became, I was always really inquisitive. And so I would sit at the bar and be sitting next to an older gentleman and I would talk to him and I would just ask them questions. I honestly, like, I I wasn't trying to talk about who I was or what I did. I actually just asked them questions and I learned more about this world and about people's stories than I would have ever have imagined. And it, it helped me to really see life differently and even enjoy it more through the lens of how other people's other people have lived. And so that, that is another way. If you remember to just be the student too, you can respect your story, value yourself and learn more about the world. Well, listen, I could go on all day. Uh, it's such great conversation and I don't want to leave anything on the table. So if there's something that, you know, uh, a, a little nugget that you could leave us with that maybe we didn't touch on today, uh, I'll leave the door open for you to do that. Yeah. I appreciate you brother. And I appreciate you having me on the show and, and being oh, able to bet. speak with your community. Um, one of the things that I find, uh, has been, um, one of the guests on my show said this, he said, there's nothing worse than being in your deathbed and looking back at all the things you could have done, or you could have been. And so the reason I bring that up is because one thing we didn't talk about that I'd love to leave your listeners with is just remember that mountaintops are brief moments within your time the journey is where the experience in life happens. If you're not living every day and not living in the moments in presence, then you're going to look back on your deathbed and wonder what it was that you did in your life or wonder what you could have done differently or what you could have been, or what are the things you could have achieved? Because at the end of the day, you're only, if you're only looking to mountaintops, you're missing the moments in life that really are what create life for us. So remember to experience your journey and remember to be present. Wow. See that that's why I gave the floor to you. That so, so much truth in that brother. There's so much truth. So tell everybody, and we'll put this in the show notes, of course, how can they get, uh, uh, get a hold of you? How can they find your podcast? Yeah. Well, thank you again, brother. Um, you guys can get a hold of me. Instagram's where I hang out the most. So Johnny, which is J-O-H-N-N-Y dot L Sasser, which is E-L-S-A-S-S-E-R. Um, shoot me a message on there. If there's anything you have a question on, you want to talk about this podcast, um, you want to talk crap on Mike, like I'm all good about that. So shoot me a DM. <laughs> no, he didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you guys can reach out to me on there and uh, I'd be happy to to talk with you guys, answer questions. I I try to chat with people on there as much as possible. Um, And then you can find the podcast anywhere you listen to it. It's the art of masculinity. Um, Go ahead, tune in. Mike was a great guest that we had on there recently. And we have a lot of other guests who've been on uh, professional athletes, um, special operations guys, business moguls, you name it. We've had guys from many different walks of life come on um, and give their story on there and give how they've persevered and come out of the other side. So, uh, truly appreciate you, Mike. Thank you. And like I said, anybody that wants to talk, I'm, I'm always here. Johnny, what a blessing to have you on the show. So appreciate you being here and, uh, wish you the best. Thanks Mike. Likewise.